start a music presentation without some happy music. Um, so the connection isn't that great. It looks like um, on my end here it it um, is working fine. Stephania, uh, are you able to hear and, and see the video fine? All right. Um, Alta, hopefully your connection will improve. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it after. Um, I also wanted to let you know that there is a file box to the left of the chat box. You see that it says files to. And if you click on the on the line that says music as a therapeutic tool, you can click on it and download the slides that I'll be presenting onto your computer. And that way you'll have a copy of it for yourself. All right. Well, my name is Dr. Marlene Sotelo, and I'm the program director for the Els for Autism Foundation. I started out in this field as a music therapist when I went to the University of Miami Music School, and I actually started working with people with autism as a music therapist. And so I know firsthand the power of music. I've been, I've been involved in music all my life as a professional singer, and my family is very musical. And not only do we know just from an emotional standpoint that music is an effective tool for therapy. We also have research to demonstrate the effects that music has on the brain and the power of music to help people learn new skills and to access their memory. So today we're gonna to be talking about what exactly the research says about music. And I'll be giving you some activities and ideas of what you can do with the people that you're working with. And so hopefully this presentation will give you information from a parent perspective, from a music therapist perspective. And even if you aren't a music therapist, and even if you don't know how to play an instrument, you can still use music in whatever intervention um, modality you are involved in. And that's what I hope you take away from today. So at the beginning of the presentation I played, some music for you. The first one was Lucky from Jason Mraz. I figured being that today was St. Patrick's Day would be nice to have a song with the theme of being lucky. And probably when you were listening to it, it evokes some type of thoughts. Maybe you thought about your loved one. Maybe you thought about today's uh, day of St. Patrick's Day. If you did, it might have even brought colors to your mind, a color green. And so the just the lyrics alone then adding the music to it can really create images in your mind and it cr can create emotions. And it could possibly be that if you really paid attention to that song, it might get stuck in your head. Same thing with Happy. Why did um, Pharrell's song Happy stick in everybody's mind? Everyone was dancing to it, everyone was singing it. First of all, it's such a catchy tune. Plus, it's a feel good tune. It just makes you feel happy. Uh, I could say that probably some people get annoyed by it, it now because it was played so much. But I still get excited when I hear that song. It makes me just think of the little minions dancing around from the movie. And uh, it, it really does lift the spirit. And I think people often forget about what music can do without even trying. If you walk into a cocktail party, and there isn't any music playing. There's kind of a dullness across the room. All you hear is the rumbling of people talking. And what you're missing is this overtone that might be at the bottom of the sound of something that pulls everybody together. And so some people really put a lot of effort into putting together a playlist 
for parties that that they're um, having that they're hosting. And that's because they really want the people to feel united by the songs and by the music that's being presented. And so when you then all of a sudden the host of the party starts playing some music, you can almost see everybody's stance change. You can see their posture change. They might even look to each other and say, hey, I love that song. Oh my goodness, that song reminds me of, and now it becomes a talking point. It's a shared experience. And so when we look at autism spectrum disorder specifically, we know that joint attention is a core deficit in many individuals with spe on the spectrum. And what joint attention is, is the sharing of an experience with another person. So when a child is little, the mom will point or the dad will point to something and say, look at the bird. And by pointing, the mother or the father is trying to share the bird flying by and it, sh and it brings that child in with the parent. Later on, the child is going to point to things to show it to the parent and look back at the parent. So it's a shared experience. And music is a great vehicle for sharing experiences with another person. And so one easy thing that you might do is just play a series of songs that you know engages that individual and see how they react. It doesn't have to be a verbal reaction. It doesn't have to be um, anything that's discussed. It's just a matter of playing the song and sharing the emotion. And it's a great way also to pull the person in to looking at you and seeing what your response is to the, to the song. So with music, it's a really good tool to be able to promote joint attention and shared experiences. It's also in and of itself is a vehicle for engagement. So we know that individuals with autism have difficulty engaging with others. And so um, the music in itself lends itself to pulling the people in the room together. So for those of you who just joined the presentation, I wanted to let you know that the, the box on the bottom right-hand corner that says Files 2 has the slides from today's presentation. So, so you can click on the words that say music as a therapeutic tool .pd, And when you click on it, then you can download it onto your computer. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna move that file over so that I can make sure that you see all of the slides. So why are we gonna use music? I touched a little bit upon that already, but we know through research that music stimulates the brain on many levels. It's a multi-sensory experience that activates different links in the brain. It pulls the sensory experiences in the brain together. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the documentary called Alive Inside. It's a beautiful documentary about um, a project that this gentleman did where he brought mini iPads, the mini uh, iPad shuffles to geriatric homes and put music that was relevant to the individual clients in these homes onto the iPads, iPods and played it for them. And the documentary goes through the lives of different people that participated in this pilot project and what the music did to elevate those people's moods to be able to bring them back to life in a, side, in a sense was really quite magical and quite powerful. For any of you who might have a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia um, or who maybe have um, a brain injury, I highly recommend that you go online and look up the information on, on this documentary called, again, Alive Inside. And it's quite powerful to, to see how just playing the music for these individuals stimulated parts of the brain in them that were dormant. In, in a sense, they, they appeared to be completely disconnected with the world. They seem to be completely depressed and really without any life inside. And the music was able to tap into those brain connections that allowed those um, emotions to be evoked to, to the point where they were able to connect with, um, with others around them again. 
Music can provide powerful triggers for memory and recall. And as I mentioned to you, the, the, this documentary, um, not only does it help the elderly, but it also helps in learning. I bet many of you remember the series that was on TV when, when at least those of us like me were younger called Schoolhouse Rock. And Schoolhouse Rock used music to teach concepts to children. It taught about the Constitution. It talked about the bills. It talked about conjunctions. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? So some of you might remember that. I, I mean, I haven't heard those in years and still the melody and the lyrics stick in my mind. And so rhythm, music, lyrics, all of that pulled together is a very powerful memory recall tool. And so when you pair new skills with song, especially with rhythm, you allow another part of the brain to be activated to be able to support learning. And it doesn't have to be a complex song. There's a whole series of songs called piggyback songs. And what they do is they take the, I'm sorry, the melody of very common songs like Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star or Bingo, and they put new lyrics to it to teach other concepts. So often when I work with people use, uh, doing music therapy, especially young children, I will make up new lyrics to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star that has something to do with their life or something to do with what I'm trying to teach them because the melody is already there. The child is already familiar with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, okay? And all you're doing is now layering the, the new content that you want to teach them on top of that familiar melody. This reduces the amount of learning that has to take place, the new learning, because they already have the melody. It also increases motivation to learn because they hear that familiar melody. And then you can layer on top the new information that you're trying to teach them. So, so it doesn't have to be something where you're writing original music. It doesn't have to be that you're a musician. You can just use songs that are familiar to the child and change the lyrics around to teach them the concepts that you are trying to work on. Music can also accelerate the learning process and improve comprehension. So this goes back to the idea of the schoolhouse rock and using the, the same piggyback songs to teach other concepts. So here I'm working with a little boy as you can imagine, I'm working on numbers. And specifically in this song, we're, we're working on counting backwards. This is the song, Five Green and Speckled Frogs. And so instead of teaching counting backwards in isolation, what a great fun way to teach counting, counting backwards. What a great and fun way to teach number identification, matching quantity to the actual number. So the little frogs, this is a Velcro board, the little frogs are on the log. We have to count the frogs and we have to match it to the number. We have to count five, four, three, two, one. And so this solidifies the academic concepts that are being taught to this child, but through song. And that increases the motivation and solidifies the learning of the new skills. Music and movement also improve the development of thinking skills. A lot of the kids that have autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities have difficulty with motor planning and motor coordination. And so we can use music to practice those skills and to work on motor planning, but through dance, through line dancing, or through motor imitation activities. So simple songs like the Hokey Pokey, we think it's pretty hokey, but um, it really is actually a great teaching tool because the kids have to think about what you're saying. They have to make their body respond to that action. So they're having to do left and right. They're having to then turn around. So they're following multi-step directions. They're doing motor imitation. They're having to plan and coordinate with the singer. There's a lot of thinking that goes into the hokey pokey. If, if you think of the song Macarena, okay, hopefully all, all of you know the Macarena, I won't sing it. And when you teach that, 
that song, you really have to think about what are the different steps, what are the different actions. So you're singing it, you're following it, the rhythm is moving you with the song, and it's helping you to work on your motor planning, motor coordination, following directions, motor imitation, all through a simple song. What a fun way to teach skills that are deficient for the, the individuals that we're working with. And again, the great thing is, is that you don't have to be a music therapist to do this. You don't have to be a musician to do it. The great thing is, is that especially nowadays with things like Spotify and Pandora, um, you, you can access songs of all sorts at any time. It's great when you can play a live instrument, but you don't necessarily have to. Music also helps students to process and understand important concepts. So this is a little guy that I worked with when I was at Nova Southeastern University. He was highly involved in regards to his motor skills. And the drum really seemed to be able to pull him in and to be able to get him motivated to lift his body up and be able to play the drum because he was able to feel the vibrations of the drum. I find that instruments that provide feedback to the individual, either through vibra mostly through vibration, really, and not just sound, are the most effective, especially for those kids who are more impaired or for those individuals that are more impaired. So a drum such as this one, that really when you lift it the way I have it in the picture, it provides feedback to the child because of the vibrations that are coming out the other end. You can also lay it flat and it provides, you know, an opportunity to lay on it and, and play it as well. But when lifted and that child hits it, the sound that comes out, the vibration actually moves to the body. And not only does it move to the body through the sound waves coming out of the drum, it also moves to the body by when he hits it and he feels the vibration. So the drum is a really powerful instrument. Um, for, for working with individuals with special needs. The other is the guitar. And granted, to a certain degree, you really need to be able to play the guitar in order to maximize its use because you wanna be able to play um, the chords properly. But there are some adapters that you can purchase pretty cheap. Uh, one, of the, one of the companies that I usually shop from is called West Music. And they have pretty inexpensive things um, that you can use and there's one that it's an adapter that goes over the the guitar frets and all you do is press one button to pr play a chord so let's let's say i'm playing a song that has three chords it has c f and g you're like oh my gosh i can't play i can't play the guitar at all but all you have to do is press the letter c and one button and press the letter g and all you do is strum so there are these adapters that go over the, the fret of the guitar to help you be able to adapt it. But even if you didn't do that, just being able for that child to feel the vibrations of the strings when they strum the strings, or if you are strumming and the guitar is on their stomach and they can feel the vibration of the strings, is a very powerful tool to, again, engage that person to be with you in the moment. And by doing so, it allows you then to get that person to learn other more complex concepts. So sometimes the music itself is not teaching a concept, but the music is allowing for pathways in the brain to open to be able to allow for more learning to occur. It also allows for the child or the individual that you're working with to be connected to you focused and interested in what you have to teach them, right? Because as a behavior analyst, uh, if any of you are out there also behavior analysts, we know that motivating operations are the key to learning. If the individual is not motivated to learn, they're likely not going to learn or they're likely going to have challenging behaviors when you are forcing them to participate in something that they do not want to. So by establishing motivating operations with that individual, they are going to be more apt to want to engage with you 
and learn the concepts that you're teaching them. So if you're if you're going to use music in your speech therapy or in your um, classroom, you can use it as as the uh, stepping stone to teaching something more complex and a non-preferred type of activity. Music also affects self-esteem and can have a profound effect on emotions and behavior. So I had the, the real pleasure of uh, several years I worked with the Autism Society down in Broward County in Miami-Dade, and I was able to lead a group of individuals with autism in singing the national anthem at the Marlins baseball game during Autism Awareness Month. And I would work with these individuals in advance and we would rehearse. And then they had the opportunity to sing at a baseball game in front of thousands of people. Now, not only did this opportunity impact them, it also impact their families as well to be able to see them be there in front of thousands of people presenting. I mean, look at their look at this photo and how beautiful their faces are. I'm not sure if typically developing people, not everybody could get in front of thousands of people in front of a microphone and sing. But these children were so motivated to share their voice, to share this experience that they were able to accomplish something that many of us probably couldn't accomplish um, on our own. And so music provides a platform for uh, demonstrating talents, gifts that this individual might have. In December, here at the Ells Center of Excellence, we had a concert and we brought in two individuals with autism that were amazing pianists. So they were able to show us that Although they may have autism and may have difficulty in connecting with others socially, they may have difficulty in their verbal communication, they are outstanding in their musical performance. And so that music and other uh, visual and performing arts give these individuals a platform for demonstrating strengths and abilities. And so for those of you working with individuals um, who do have noted skills in the area of music or the arts, it's really important to uh, capitalize on those skills and give them opportunities to shine and to demonstrate to others what they're able to do. So let's talk a little bit about the power of music in everyday experiences. Um, or do we have any music musicians um, of participating today? I recognize a couple of you um, right now, and I, I know that a couple of you that are on there are not musicians. Um, but anyway, you don't have to be a musician to know that music is around us everywhere. Think about video games. As soon as you turn on a video game, whether it's an app on a tablet or iPad, or even when, if you're playing um, Nintendo or Xbox, usually the game starts with music. You also have music videos that are popular on MTV or they're, they're on Vimeo and YouTube. There's also, everyone's, probably everyone either has an MP3 player or an iPod or an iPad, some, some type of music player. It always makes me laugh when I hear people with their ringers on and then they have a certain ringer on them um, for the, their different family members or friends. And then we have music-based TV shows. So Campbell, Conell, and Beagle tell us that music is a central part of life for many students and it may serve as a vehicle for self-expression and emotional release. And approximately 90% of students listen to music on a daily basis. That's a lot. 90% of students listen to music on a daily basis, and while many play a musical instrument. So if that high percentage of individuals are listening to music daily, we have to use music as a, as a vehicle for learning, for engaging, for promoting communication. Because if they're listening to it, especially on their own, if they are initiating the desire to engage in musical activities, even if it's just passively listening, then we know that that's, again, uh, something that's motivating to them and could be the stepping stone to being able to engage in more challenging 
skills or more challenging um, interactions such as social interactions. So let's look at some of the video games. We Music, that these are just dedicated to music. Um, Guitar Hero, Rock Band, um, I Love Dance uh, Supernova, right? And I'll tell you, the Dance Supernova, not only is it great because of the music, but talk about teaching motor coordination and motor planning. If you can use this with the kids that you're working with to be able to work specifically on that, if, I don't know if, I have, if we have any OTs, um, occupational therapists, or physical therapists in the audience, but that program is a great one to be able to use uh, with a child that is uh, difficult to engage, but really likes music. So you're able to, again, work on the motor planning, motor skills, motor coordination through um, basic dance skills. And also just so you know, on YouTube, you can get some of those type of dance, dance revolution videos right on YouTube. So you won't get the feedback that the video game provides you when you're when you're on that pad that's on the floor or with the Wii when you have the actual handles. But you could still follow along on the on YouTube with the Dance Revolution videos. And then, of course, we have, as I mentioned, all of the music players that are that are available. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, either my child or the some of the kids that I work with, they're really sensitive to sound and, and they cover their ears all the time. But don't let that stop you from using music with them. Sometimes it's the pitch that is affecting them. So I'll give you an example. There were um, these little boys that I was working with earlier this year um, through our goals program. And they they really loved music. We were doing a lot of great activities. And I used the microphone with them that's connected, the microphone that was connected to the piano that you'll see in, shortly on one of the videos. And it was great. They loved singing into the, to the microphone. It was, it was really very positive. But then I brought my amplifier. It was a guitar amplifier. And I connected the microphone to the guitar amplifier. And the, the timbre and the tone of the sound that came out of that guitar amplifier was very different than the way their voices sounded in the microphone plugged into the piano, the electric piano. And one of the boys quickly covered his ears and he was like, no, 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 no. And I, at first I thought, well, that's strange. I wonder maybe he doesn't want to do it today. And then it took me a while to realize that the, the difference in the sound quality and the high pitched background of the um, of the sound coming out of the guitar amplifier versus the one on the piano. So sometimes it's the pitch, sometimes it's the timbre, um, it's the underlying tone. It could also be that these in the individual has had um, negative experiences where they've had they've been frightened by loud sounds or maybe uh, yelling either at home or at school or in the community, um, those, those sounds have set for them the stage for eliciting a negative response. And so we can slowly desensitize them to enjoying different types of music, one, by playing it really low, giving them choices, letting them hear a little bit of the song and then turning it off, you can also use noise canceling headphones that allow for a much more richer experience in listening to music. If any of you have ever um, used like um, Bose or the Dr. Dre noise canceling headphones, those headphones, what's really cool about them is that you don't feel like you're hearing out of your ear. It almost feels as if it's coming from the top of your head. It's like a surround sound. And so because the sound is more sparsed out, it reduces the intensity of the sensation in the ears. So if you have a child that you're working with that, that has that sensitivity um, and you have access to those types of headphones because they're not cheap, you might want to try, you might, might want to try that. And again, the more control that we give to the individual of the experience, the more likely they are to have a positive experience with it. So you know, you can put the headphones on without any song coming on and then give it to the child or the individual that you're working with and tell them to put it on with no music at all. 
Oh, look, look at what it sounds like. Look at what it feels like. Okay, now you pick a song and let them pick it and you can show them that it's going to be really low and then have them have a positive experience. One, two, three, all done, take it off. And little by little, you can start to um, provide positive experiences with music for them so that they can begin to change their it, um, the connection that they have with sounds to a more positive one. Okay. Are you all with me? I hope so. All right. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I love my music shows. I love The Voice. I love American Idol. Um, I used to watch Dancing with the Stars as well. These are really popular shows. They're really popular shows, I believe, not only because of the characters in it, but because of the music. The music engages people. They want to be part of it. They can't wait to hear what the other, you know, what the next performance is going to be like. So even in our media um, and our pop culture, we see the power of music. So why are we going to use music with special needs students? Well, music is a form of social routine and it encourages individuals to take turns. So you're gonna play, I'm gonna play. I play, I take the instrument, now you take the instrument. Not only does it encourage taking turns, but we can also play together. So we can improvise and you do something and I echo you. And then you play again and I mirror you. And we have a musical conversation where there's no words that have to be exchanged. It also fosters responsiveness in individuals who are hard to engage. That's probably one of the most powerful things that I've found with music, that you work with someone who seems totally disconnected, who maybe is just roaming around the room, doesn't really want to be part of the group, but you start to see little moments where the music is the one pulling that individual in. The music in itself forms that connection. And before you know it, that person is lifting their head and looking at you. Before you know it, they're taking your hand and having you play the drum. Before you know it, they're sitting next to you, touching the guitar, feeling the vibration. And so when you let the music do its magic, you see incredible things happen. Also, due to its repetitive nature, the individual quickly learns to recognize a tune and anticipate what's coming next or request that an activity continue. And you're, hopefully if my videos work, you're gonna be able to see that at the final video, a really good example of that. So what happens is, is that with people with autism, routine gives meaning and makes sense to them. We know that routine is a comfort and allows for clear expectations. So think about music. The song is always the same. You know what the rhythm is. You know when the melody is. You know that first comes the verse, then the chorus, verse, then chorus, and maybe a bridge. You know that it has a beginning and end. There's a lot of predictability with songs. So that predictability, if used as the framework for an activity, allows the individual to know what the expectations are, knows when the beginning is, knows when the end is. In addition, we know that if we formulate activities with routines, that the child after, or the child, and I apologize if I'm saying child and, and you work with an adult, uh, because this, this really is relevant to all ages, um, is that when you use the music to form routines, the individual is more likely to participate. So that's the same when you do play activities. If you read a book, and if you're using books with the individual and you're reading a book to them and you always do the same thing, you read the line and then you point to a picture, turn the page, read the line, point to a picture, turn the page. When you do that same routine over and over, after a few times, the person you're working with is going to point to the picture after you read the line. They're going to ask you to turn the page. They already know what the routine is. The same thing goes with music. The song allows for the individual to know when to fill in a word. They know when to clap their hands. They know when the break is gonna happen in the song and they have to pause. So 
if you're using music, try and use the same music or the same activity repeatedly because after a few times that you use that activity, that song, that dance, they're going to become more engaged and more participatory because they know what the expectation is and they can jump in and, and, and join the party in a sense uh, and be successful. Um, this was a, the adult group that we had. We were able to run music therapy groups for, uh, for adults with d disabilities. And we had some individuals that were really difficult to engage. And by the end of the sessions, the um, eight sessions, we really had them all involved in their own way. And it was, it was really nice to see, again, the power of music to get them connected and in a group socializing in a nonverbal way with their peers. Individuals respond to rhythm and intonation before they understand language. The underlying both music and spoken la language are tone patterns, stress, and rhythm. So. Think about when you send a text or an email. I don't know about all of you, but I often reread my emails before I send them, especially if it's something that I think might be misconstrued. Because what happens is, is that when we have the written word, there is no tone or stress or rhythm. And so what you write can be construed in a different way from the perspective of the reader. When you speak, there is intonation and melody to your voice. So let's take this example. If I say, do you want to go to lunch with me? That means one thing. Do you want to go to lunch with me? That means something else. Do you want to go to lunch? Those three, I'm saying the same thing. But my tone, the stress, the rhythm, the intonation that I use sends a different message. And so... Within music, we are able to be able to teach the power of the spoken word, the power of intonation and melody to be able to communicate your message. And also rhythm allows um, a foundation to being able to speak. So some of you may have heard of melodic intonation therapy. And what that does is, is bring rhythm to speaking to allow for um, again, a vehicle for the brain to be able to produce a spoken word with rhythmic patterns. And so when you're able to use drumming or tapping, you can use sticks, you can use drums, any kind of rhythm. Um, when you're using, when you're promoting a verbal communication, you're going to see much more positive outcomes. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be drums. You can use rhythm sticks um, or, or other types of rhythmic instruments. Music can also be used to encourage vocal play as well as practice of words and phrases. This is especially helpful for individuals with minimal speech due to um, things such as apraxia. So I'm going to try and play a video here for you. Um, let me see if I can make it happen. This is a, I'm going to share my screen right now. Oops. Oh my, I had a lot of windows open there. I apologize. All right, so let's give it a whirl. Okay. Were you able to see that and hear it? Great. All right. So this is a, a young man that um, has a great deal of challenges with vocal production. And through the song, you can see that I was just simply saying la, la, la. La 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 la, and I kept repeating that same simple melody, 
and through the through the routine through the repetitiveness of and the simplicity of this ver vocal play he was able to clearly produce la la um and that was a really special moment for him to be able to do that. I only had the opportunity to work with him one-on-one -on -one for about 20 minutes uh, because he was with other children prior to that. And so they had to leave and then I got to work with him one-on-one. -on -one. And so in a very short time, he was able to produce some really nice vocalizations um, just using simple melodies um, that I was singing. And again, you might say, well, but you are, but you're playing piano and I don't know how to play piano. You don't, you don't need to use the piano. You can just say la 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 uh, without, without accompanying yourself on the piano. All right, let's keep going. So music often has a physical component such as moving the body or making physical contact with another person. So especially like through dance or if you're playing the piano and the guitar together, it, it promotes physical contact, which allows for those who are more sensitive to touch and connection with another person to be able to do so in a safe and motivating experience. Lyrics help language comprehension. And when you use a familiar song, uh, sung repetitively in a daily context, it helps the individual associate key words with people, objects, and events. Let's think about one simple one that probably some of you might say, oh, don't sing that song. Okay, the Barney song, clean up, clean up. Everybody everywhere. Right. We all know that song. If you don't, look it up on YouTube. When kids hear that song, they know what they're supposed to be doing. Why? Because it's repetitive, it's simple, and it's been associated with an activity. So think about other things in the routine of an individual's life that you can put songs to that will help with transition, will help with independent functioning, will help with following directions. Participation in music can be nonverbal and it reduces the emphasis on talking. So it's really important, especially for those individuals that we're working with that um, have minimal verbal output or have difficulty with uh, vocal processing. Music is a universal language and it can be used in a non-threatening setting to help in developing relationships, learning academics, developing self-expression, communication, social skills, and both gross and motor fine motor skills. So um, this is a thesis project that was done by Jane Barry Moore. It's called The Effects of Music Therapy on the Social Behavior of Children with Autism. A really nice paper that was written. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how music can be used for academics goals and school readiness. So this is just a snapshot of some basic skills that are taught to uh, younger children or those who are developmentally delayed um, and still working on some fundamental skills. Uh, so knowing your numbers, following the leader and walking, jumping, uh, knowing the names of the colors, knowing basic shapes, identifying words. So these are just some a snapshot of the different areas. So let's look at how we could create music-based goals that focus on academics. So we have pre-academic goals. Grant will take turns using a shared musical instrument with one peer for two exchanges in four out of five opportunities. So you might see this goal and say, oh, well, that, that looks like a goal that my child has on their IEP or my student has on their IEP, but it says Grant will take turns using a puzzle or using a book with one peer for two exchanges. Well, it could be with a music instrument. It could be with a simple music instrument. I'm gonna shake the maraca and then I'm gonna pass it to my friend, shake the maraca. So during circle time, you can be working on turn taking using music instruments. Grant will answer yes, no questions two times per group 80% of the time. So now we're, we're working on answering yes, no. Do you want the piano or do you want this song? Grant will request a preferred instrument, song, activity using a preferred mode of communication, using a two word combination, my piano, want, frogs, more, guitar, in four out of five opportunities. 
So now we're working on requesting through music. And lastly, following one-step commands, Grant will follow a one-step action command as stated by the teacher given a gestural prompt. Give me the guitar. Get the accordion. Stand by Maria during the line dance. So you can see how these are, if you're a music therapist or a music teacher, these would be perfect goals for you to be working on in the music class. If you're not, if you're a speech therapist, if you're a classroom teacher, you could still have these types of goals in the IEP, right? But you're using them, you're, you're, the tool that you're using to get to them is with music because that's what motivates that student. It doesn't matter how, how we work on requesting. If we're working on requesting and the child is learning how to request, that's the key. And if music is the way that they're going to learn how to request, how they're going to learn to follow two-step directions, let's use it. So let's look at more complex academics. Grant will independently read sight words at a primer level when presented within preferred song lyrics. Using song lyrics is a great way to teach sight words. You can be on a scavenger hunt. You have the word, the, the song printed really large, or now with smart boards, if you're in a classroom and you have smart boards, you can project it on the smart board and the kids can come over and they can circle all the words on the lyrics, all the the words, uh, whatever sight words you're working on. If you're uh, musically inclined and you can write your own original song with the vocabulary for that week, think about how powerful that would be. If you wrote a, a, a song, you can even do a piggyback song using a known um, melody like Twinkle Twinkle, and you could write a song using all of the vocabulary that's for that book of the week. And then the kids go searching for those words in the printed lyrics. You can identify basic parts of speech. What are all the nouns? What are all the verbs using preferred song lyrics? There's so many songs out there just for teaching science, science and social studies concepts. So Grant will name the 50 states of the USA by singing the state song with 80% accuracy. To this day, my son, who is now 17, still remembers the state song that he learned in elementary school. He can sing all of it. Why? Because the melody, it, they sang it so many times, the melody, the rhythm stuck. And so why, again, not use music to be able to teach those difficult to learn concepts? And Grant will answer basic WH questions of songs after reading and singing the lyrics with 80% accuracy. We know that a lot of individuals on the spectrum have difficulty answering WH questions. What a fun way to, to work on this using music lyrics instead of just books or other boring types of activities. Not that they're all boring, but of course, being that I love music, I know how exciting it is to be able to work on these skills through songs. So there's a company called Prelude Music Therapy, and they have um, music, songs that are already written to, uh, to teach different concepts. So what you do is you print them out and you create a file folder and then you can actually have manipulatives that go with the song. So this one is adding numbers and it's to the tune of coming around the mountain. Adding numbers really is a snap. Adding numbers really is a snap. I can add those numbers, I can add those numbers. Adding numbers really is a snap. It's fun. And so inside there are manipulatives that um, work on the different uh, addition problems. Here's another one from Prelude Music Therapy, and this one's working on the letter bear. This is an original song, so it's not a piggyback. You would have to actually know what the melody is um, to be able to, to do it. So here the child then takes the letter and it matches it to the letter bear that, that goes with it. So again, it's called Prelude Music Therapy, and they have, I think, three different volumes of um, books that have songs, everything from academic concepts to brushing your teeth and um, independent living concepts. I highly recommend it. Um, oh my goodness, okay, we're running out of time. So let's also talk about music instruction. Music instruction really is a, a great way to help these individuals to have something special of their own. So the difficult thing is to find a teacher, a music teacher that knows how to work with someone with autism or with special needs. So you don't have to find a music therapist, but you have to find a patient 
understanding, and open-minded music teacher that is willing to use visual supports, willing to use structure, predictability in their music instruction to be able to make your child or your student successful. And so making sure to be able to tell that music instructor what are the things that work for your child or for your student are gonna be key to helping them be successful. So the goals of music instruction are as follows. We can get auditory and visual tracking out of teaching music. Now, this is different from what we talked about before because what we talked about before was using music as a vehicle for teaching other concepts. Now we're talking about actually teaching an instrument. So you're gonna teach them how to play piano, you're gonna teach them how to play guitar, teach them how to play the violin. So um, it also works on eye-hand coordination. It works on bilateral arm and finger coordination, works on sequential memory and recall, eye-hand coordination, being able to look at the music and then come down and be able to play. It works on anticipating and planning ahead. And of course, the accomplishment and self-esteem of being able to learn how to play a song. And what's really cool about that adapter that I mentioned to you for the guitar is that anybody can play the guitar with this adapter. All you would do is um, show in a really big cue card, C, D, C, G, and the child will just press that one button on the guitar and be able to play a whole number of songs um, on the guitar using the adapter. It also works on self-discipline uh, self because as we know, you have to practice to be good at music. And so it, it's something that the child can do every day to practice in preparation for their next lesson. All right, so to wrap things up and then I'll, I'll open for a few questions, I wanna play one last video. And so this video is going to show you a little boy um, what, that he loves music. So I didn't have to convince him to participate in music. You're going to see in the video that there's some therapists that are watching on the back. Um, so you're gonna be some, see some extraneous people in the room. So disregard those extraneous people and you're gonna see the child and the parents sitting behind. And what I want you to focus on is noticing how the child is engaged. He is not verbal in the sense of being able to communicate any words. He does produce sounds. He does engage with eye contact, but he has some challenges that we were able to work through in music. He really loved the song, Five Little Monkeys Jumping on a Bed, which is another great song to work on counting, counting backwards, uh, matching quantity to numbers. And so you'll see how he is able to uh, use the song as a way of doing the counting. Um, he also is going to attempt to produce a sound, which is really challenging for him, and how he's able to communicate also non-verbally through, through the song. So let's, let's pull that up. Give me one moment. All right, uh, I hope you were able to see that. On my screen, it appears as if you're able to see and, and hear. So he was really excited to share that moment with the, the girls that were in the room that were her, his therapist. And so what happened, if you, if you were able to see, when I was going, ow, and I exaggerated, ouch, and I waited so that he could process what was happening 
what I was doing. And I don't think from that angle you could see what I could see, but his mouth, he was trying to go and do it. So he was really watching my mouth, really trying to process the production of that sound. And for me, just the fact that he was um, attempting to motorically create uh, or formulate the ow sound was a great accomplishment. And then you also saw that he went, no, no, no. Uh, so that's the beauty of music is that you can engage and you can um, work with an individual that doesn't have any verbal abilities or has minimal verbal abilities. And it becomes such a powerful uh, tool to teach, to engage, to motivate, and to demonstrate abilities that none otherwise would be shown. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation.